Through my scope, I see him standing there on the brink of oblivion. I imagine he is contemplating his existence, whether to take that step. He sways with a mild wind, allowing its breeze to caress him like a mother rocks her child. He looks over his shoulder as if to see if someone was there to give him encouragement. There is no one. I imagine he is alone in this world and this is his only way. As he turns, the look in his eye has changed. No longer is it fear, but that of determination. He takes the step. I lean closer as if to be able to stop him. I scream in my head for him to go back. My hand instinctively reaches out as though I could push him backwards from 500 yards away. I close my eyes, cringing at the anticipation of the commotion that is about to occur. Deafening silence. I strengthen in my resolve and look back through the scope, watching him walk towards me. I have trained for 20 years to survive in a combat situation, how to fight, to read others, to determine if they are a threat. I have trained for decades to strengthen my mind and body. I've mastered the art of hand-to-hand -hand combat. I can accurately shoot my rifle and sidearm with near pinpoint accuracy. I have learned to numb my emotions by the loss of my closest friends and seeing what my own rifle can do to the enemy. I can shoot a man in the center of his chest from 500 yards away and put a knife through his throat so close I can count the cavities in his mouth. I've gone through psychological profiles before and after every combat tour to ensure I can still be considered sane. As he walks towards me, all my years of training, my decades of experience vanish like smoke in a breeze. I was lost in a sea of emotion. There he was, a child, no older than my own 13-year-old son, walking towards me, but not to me. He was walking to a discarded vehicle left in the middle of an ancient minefield, a leftover from a past war, a constant reminder of the horrors this country has seen. He walks with purpose, knowing that if he makes it to that shattered hulk eroding in the sand, he might be able to find something to sell to the Taliban. He knows that the price is high. The bigger the item, the more destructive it can be, the better off he will be. An old artillery shell can feed him for a month, but anything salvaged can feed him for a day, possibly a week. He knows that the Marines guarding the small outpost 500 yards away are authorized to shoot and kill anyone they deem a threat. His livelihood depends on what he finds just as the weapon he wears across his back is his way to survive. He's been raised here, and he knows that there is safety in the field that has seen so much death. Many have tried before him. The field is strewn with signs of those who have failed. Shreds of cloth here, a crater there, even a shoe or two are scattered about. He knows that, there, that where death once was, he is safe. A landmine can only explode once. He arrives at the crater and jumps inside, resting for a moment, kneeling down as if to pray to his God to give him strength to continue his journey. As he hunkers down into the depression, I see my own children playing at the beach, building sandcastles, burying each other, laughing as they run and jump into holes not much different from the one the child is resting in now only 300 yards from my position. From this distance, I can easily hit the target. The wind is blowing slightly from right to left. The sun is behind me, erasing all shadows and highlighting my target. In actuality, it would be an easy shot and be justified under the rules of engagement. As I sight in on the boy, I make the appropriate adjustments to my rifle. I firmly grasp the pistol grip, pulling it slightly towards me, ensuring the stock of the weapon is uncomfortably in the pocket of my shoulder. I rest the barrel of the weapon in, my, in the palm of my forward hand, allowing it to just lay there until the moment is necessary. 
My trigger finger hovers next to the trigger, waiting for the moment. My shooting position is perfect. No one, no one would question why I pulled the trigger. I would more than likely get a few good jobs and wow, from the younger, less seasoned Marines who talk openly about seeing action and wanting to shoot something other than a paper target. Young Marines who have been raised in front of a television screen playing modern warfare <coughs> and simulated wars around the world who also tend to treat life as just another simulation. But there is no reset button, no pause, and no cheat code. I hold my position, watching the target with my finger next to the trigger. He lifts himself up out of his hole and stands at the threshold, his prize a mere 50 yards away. But it might as well be 100, 1,000, or 10,000, for the distance isn't the problem. It's what's between and underneath. He takes a step and begins to walk again. As he moves, his eyes are ever vigilant, shifting, searching, a tell, possible danger. Nothing can be seen. Footstep after footstep, his body tenses that it might be his last. I can see him clearer now. The sweat of his brow, the dirt of his face, and even the beginning of manhood as a slight wispy mustache is starting to darken above his lip. I can also see that he is no stranger to war. A ragged scar runs from where his left ear should be to the corner of his mouth. He is missing two fingers from his left hand, and I postulate that the entire left side of his body is battle damaged in some way, possibly the effects of a landmine he was fortunate to walk away from. More than likely, as I have seen too many times, when he was an infant, his mother shielded him from the danger, protecting him with her own body leaving scars as a reminder of her love. I watch closely. He is just 25 yards away. His pace is slow and methodical, choosing each step carefully. I again reminisce of my children when I see, send them to bed for the evening. The slow, intentional walk down the hall, hoping a reprieve might come, allowing them to just watch one more show. No reprieve ever comes for them nor will there be for the boy who was squarely in my sights. He is only yards away, the fruit of his labor within his grasp. My body stiffens, ready to shoot. He climbs into the mangled mass of the vehicle whose ancient armor shields him from my sight. The world envelops me. Behind me, I can hear the distant sound of music playing on the radio. Marines on a break from what lies outside our walls are playing cards to occupy their minds. The smell of baked chicken being prepared for the evening meal lofts up to me. And for a moment, I can relax and take in the world. Tick, tick, tick. The hours of the second hand slowly pass. When I see the boy exiting the vehicle, I am funneled back into the reality that lay in my sights. In his hands is a wooden box filled with miscellaneous wires and pieces of scrap metal resting on top of is his personal fortune, a cylindrical shaped object that resembles an old Soviet mortar shell. The boy doesn't waste any time. He begins crossing the field as fast as possible, attempting to retrace his step that brought him to his personal treasure trove. Thud, thud. Thud, the emptying and filling of my heart is now keeping time. I tighten in my position to ensure I can get a clean shot. The boy has now become the enemy. Never mind the rifle he wears across his back. Every six-year-old in this country has one. The mortar shell, if sold to the Taliban, can be used against the Marines and soldiers in the field. He moves quickly. I adjust for his speed. My finger slips into the trigger, and I can feel the warmth of the indifference still as I apply slight pressure. My weapon is ready. He reaches the crater where I imagine him praying and abruptly stops. He's frozen. Not a muscle is moving. Can he feel the barrel of my weapon bearing down on him? He's motionless. Beads of sweat roll down the back of his neck. He's breathing heavy. He stands for what seems like eternity. Click. I apply more pressure to my trigger. He slowly lowers the box of goods down from his chest and looks up to the sky. Click. I place my thumb on the safety, ready to unleash the dogs of war. Boom! 
Every Marine from around the compound stops what they are doing and rushes to the perimeter with rifles in hand to defend our position. It takes the cloud of sand and debris from the explosion 10 minutes to finally settle. After a few minutes, the all clear is sounded and everybody goes back to what they were doing before. The music starts to play, the games continue, and I helplessly look out across the field of oblivion. A torrent of emotion swells. I'm confused. Was that me? No, my weapon is still unsafe. Where's the boy? He's gone. I am thankful. It wasn't me. I didn't have to. I would have. I could have. This time, this time, it wasn't my choice. My soul, though empty, is still intact. I am angry and demoralized. I understand why the boy made the trek. All this child wanted was to live, to survive. I think of all the children that have crossed my path, the ones on the side of the road begging for change, the ones in the refugee camps waiting in never-ending lines, the ones, even the ones that have stolen from me. They all had one thing in common, the will to survive. That boy was doing what he had to do to survive. He was looking for a way to survive for more than just today. Just so he wouldn't have to walk through a minefield tomorrow. As I walk off the plane two months later, I see my children standing there on the edge of the runway. I couldn't help but think of the boy and his trek and all that had happened. I have killed. I have hurt others, justified or not. But I have also loved and cared for my enemy as I have loved and cared for my own children. Now, they are all here, together, running to me. Thank you. Adam Stone.